Uh, I've been writing for longer than that, um, but I want to talk about the first book I actually got printed out in some sort of a covered form. And uh, I'm mainly going to be talking today about technical books, hopefully on open source software. Uh, if you want to talk about mystery novels, I have one that I have 80% done that I'm trying to finish. If you want to talk about romance novels, I have a contact for you. I have a friend in grad school who, as a joke, sent a book into Harlequin and ended up with a five-book series and has gone on from there and hasn't looked back. So, as I said earlier, this is a book on getting uh, a, something you're interested in the open source community into some sort of book format and getting it out into the hands of others. This is wonderful for the open source community because we need to share information. We don't really have any big corporate sugar daddies for the most part pushing open source and how to use it easily. And this is a way to spread your information that you have. So why write a book? Well, no better way to find out how much you do not know about a subject than trying to write about it. Uh, writing is teaching. Uh, by the way, the only person I know who does fairly well on publishing technical books is Rasmus Lerdorf. Why? Because he wrote the original PHP book. O'Reilly signed a contract that said, for every time the book is translated into another language, you get a X thousand dollar check. By the way, O'Reilly has changed their, their, their standards and their contract on that. I think the PHP book's been translated to 23, 24 different languages. So, and considering what, they, what the fabled number is, it's really not that big of a paycheck, but it's um, rather nice to see, know that some folks do get some money. Also, it's uh, a little bit of fame. Your family will be impressed. I was very shocked that my sister actually went out and bought my book off Amazon. Um, there's no groupies, unfortunately, so I know there's going to be a deep point around that. Uh, it's also very impressive to you on your resume that you wrote a book, that you actually have something. I've also been warned that you'll go on an interview and someone will argue about the technology you're talking about and they will have a copy of your book on the shelf and they'll tell you that this guy who wrote this book knows everything and you know nothing, Jon Snow. Okay, the idea. Uh, what are you writing about? Uh, two years ago, I was sitting in an airport and looking at the documentation that MySQL had on one of our new features and it was obvious that the documentation was lifted from the engineer's work logs. Uh, I don't know if any of you read engineer work logs for major software projects, but they're about as comprehensible as VCR instructions that you got with VCRs from Japan in the 1970s before they really actually hired people to, it, who had English writing skills to actually tell you how to use your VCR. Um, it wasn't as concise, uh, didn't have a lot of examples, and I thought our our stuff was lacking, so I decided to start writing notes, and it turned into a book. Now, you basically have two options. Uh, the first one is go ahead, plunge in, start writing your own book. That's what I did with my first book, and it's not what I recommend. Uh, why did I do that? I did it that way because I wasn't sure I had enough material for a book, and as it is, my book ended up um, fairly thin at just over 120 pages. Um, you could also write a book proposal. There are lots of publishers out there looking for content. Um, I won't mention all of them, but I'm gonna mention a couple of them that I like, and there's other ones out there that uh, may have different reputations, may have slightly better deals, but it's all roughly the same process. So you basically have two options, and ironically, uh, if you do decide to write the book first, I recommend that you do go through and write your own book proposal. Um, all reputable publishers will have some sort of guide that they want, and it's a good way to make sure that you have a checklist to get everything you want done, done. And if you are following a, the guide for a publisher, make sure you read it, make sure you follow it. Got to remember these folks aren't usually highly technical, but they know they're English, so they will catch spelling mistakes. Make sure your gerund phrases match. Um, they will catch grammar mistakes, which is good and bad. Uh, a lot of times they'll correct them for you, so if your English skills are not all that wonderful, they can help you out there, but they don't know your tech and they can't help you there. Now, A-Press books, uh, I'm going to use them for an example. Um, I don't write for them. 
I've uh, talked to writing for them, but uh, I like their process. They actually have a guide out there, and they say, okay, uh, in, your, in your submission to us, what's the main title of your book? Is there a subtitle? Um, they tend to do um, introducing or master or expert, and then they low on a tagline. Here, I'll pass this one around. If anyone wants a copy of this book, Dr. Bell is, has uh, graciously dedicated. Um, but they have a tagline that they want to use on the bottom of the book. Author data, 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 ugh, data. Uh, every author, if you're running with someone else, you're going to want to submit this for them. They want to know who you are, what your background is. You don't have to have an extensive background. Sometimes uh, you'll find out that someone who has two years with Kubernetes has been at it a long time. Uh, someone who's been writing C for, for 15 years might still be a relative newcomer. So uh, make sure you give your detail. And make sure you give them your full name, your mailing address, phone number, and email address. I have a friend who's a screenwriter in Hollywood. Best script he ever saw. I wanted to option it. No return address on the envelope. No name. No title. Um, but it was a great script, and uh, they had no one to offer it to, so they had to throw it away. Next, they want a description. They're going to want three to four paragraphs on what the book does. Why are you writing this? Who's the audience? Um, why does this matter? Um, share everything you think would be helpful. Like if you're writing a book on Kubernetes, um, they don't know the text, so you're going to have to tell them what Kubernetes is, what it does, what it's replacing, how it helps people. Uh, unique selling points. What is unique about your book? What is the gotcha that someone walking through a bookstore or, or looking through Amazon will say, aha, that's why I need this book? What readers will learn? What are you trying to teach in this book? Um, if you're doing a intro to Bash Shell, you're not going to set up an entire section on DevOps and how to keep your CI system working. You're going to do more basics, more concepts. Uh, if you're doing a book on advanced DevOps, you probably don't want to do a lot of bash scripting. Source code. Does your book contain source code or other ancillary materials useful to a re reader? Are you going to have a GitHub repository where they can download samples, uh, where they can get the code? Um, I'll also mention something later. If you have code in your book, make sure you keep a separate copy somewhere off in a GitHub repository or a Dropbox, something like that because you'll have a technical editor who will need to proof your code. And it's much nicer to keep them from cutting and pasting from, the source, or from your uh, source document, your manual. Audience, who are you writing this book for? Are you writing for someone who's uh, learning the program? Someone who's been developing for two to three years? Uh, someone who's very experienced but doesn't know whatever you're teaching about? Uh, it helps to have a specific audience, and it helps to have an idea rightly roughly when you're writing, who's going to be reading the book. Uh, earlier this year, I taught an intro to MySQL class to a bunch of young ladies for Austin, Austin's Chick Tech. Uh, a bunch of 14-year-old to 18-year-old females have a lot different perspective and knowledge base than you folks. Uh, I can talk about database normalization or data normalization, and I expect a fair amount of you will have a rough idea what that is. They had no idea what I meant between integers and alphanumeric. So I had to scale back my presentation to cover that level of information. Also, if you can have a secondary audience, a tertiary audience, um, put that in there. Oh, by the way, I just learned the Department of Education is going off and using Gentoo uh, Linux. So right there, there's 40,000 extra million copies that you could sell to that audience. And I don't know if that's true about the Department of Education or anything like that, but make up something like that. Uh, competition. What other books on the subject matter you're writing are out there or that you know that's coming out there? Um, if you're writing a book on Perl, how does it compare to what Larry Wall has put out in the past? Uh, if, you're, um, if you're basically covering the same territory that another author has covered for that publisher, they may not want it. I want to write a book on common table expressions and a press didn't want to touch it because they already had a book on common table expressions. Um, would, mine would have been much better, but 
Oh, well. Estimated page count or word count. How big do you expect this book to be? Got to remember, at one point, for most of these books, we are killing trees, and they want to make sure that you know, there's an investment there that it, it does OK. Estimated schedule. And this is where everyone blows it on their first book. Um, can you give us an idea when you expect to be completed the first two chapters of the book? Oh, you did the first two chapters in a month, and it's going to be 20 chapters long? So let's see, that's 10 months to write? No, no, it doesn't work that way. Uh, first two chapters of a book are usually the easiest because you're doing introduction material. You're, co you're kind of doing a synopsis of what's going to come on. That's the easiest stuff to write. Uh, things get more technical, things bog down, they get slower, and you run into other problems. Rough out the book. APRESS says, go ahead and put out the chapter name, uh, chapter content goal, uh, first level heading, and then go chapter goal, subheading, 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 and fill in that. Uh, there are other guides out there that will tell you to outline everything in your book and then go back and take the major bullet points for all the outlines and make those your chapters and fill in from there. I don't know a lot of folks who write that way. Um, I tend to write two or three subheadings and then write the, the major heading above that and then put in filler material and the next thing I know I have 20 pages for a chapter. Everyone has their own separate writing style. Now Manning Publications is similar to A Press where they want you to define what are the minimum, minimum qualifications for someone to buy your book, read it, and understand it, and be able to use it? This means you have to have a rough idea of what your audience is like. By the way, shows like this, when you're talking to folks and you're, you're uh, telling them what you're doing, uh, is a great way to kind of test proof the level for your book. So if you're here talking, um, like Jim might be talking about uh, firebombing your hardware to make sure that it's appropriate, how you run those tests and all that. That would be a wonderful book. But if he doesn't know how many people in the audience know the basis of how he's doing that, he can kind of get a good judge of it by talking to folks. Um, also, they want you to be fairly specific. Um, is it general knowledge, or is it uh, someone with no hands-on? Do they have programming skills of some level? What if they have programming skills but nothing in functional program? They don't understand all that Lambda calculus stuff. Uh, who's your audience? Also, uh, what's a typical job role for your primary reader? Uh, four years experience as a front-end engineer, uh, entry-level system admin, or uh, why does someone want to buy this book? Do they want to learn Kubernetes because they hear it's the hot thing and they're looking for another job? How do you find your audience and how do you shoehorn them into your book? Next thing, if you are not self-employed, you have to check with your boss. What are the writing rules? What do they expect? Uh, do they have to review everything? Does your boss have to review it? One of your senior engineers have to review it? And then legal gets a pass at it? Um, it depends. Uh, what are the writing rules? Are you allowed to use your equipment from work? Are you allowed to do this on work time? Um, also, they might want a bit of the very tiny bit of pie that you're going to get. Maybe they want to uh, share your royalties, but you have to have that all dedicated up in front. Now, I work for Oracle, and as you all are well aware, Oracle believes in hiring as many lawyers as they can. So we have a process where you tell them what you're doing and who you're doing it for. I was lucky I was writing for the Oracle Press, which was at then a uh, imprinter for um, a major publishing house. They switched, since changed that. But they had a process where they could go through and say, OK, you can use the logo, you can use the trademark, um, we'll do a little bit of promotion here, you do a little bit of promotion there. But they had it all sussed out so they knew who was doing what and to whom. So once you get your proposal written up, what I recommend you do is go out someplace where no one will hear you with a hard copy of it and read it out loud to yourself. When you get done cringing, go back and rewrite the stuff that made you cringe, print it again, and try it again until you get to a point where it doesn't actually make you crawl. It just, if you haven't done this sort of thing before, it, it's very easy to, uh, to frustrate yourself. But once you get it to where you really like it, spell check it. 
have someone else in your family or a friend who uh, at least passed an English class sometime in their life read through it. And then you're going to send your, your uh, proposal off to the company. And make sure you see, see yourself with a copy. One is it gives you a timestamp, and B, it also lets you remember later what you actually promised. Now, I recommend that you do the per book proposal route, even if you're going to go with the self-publishing, uh, mainly because it helps you lay out the book, helps you um, not verbalize, but actually lay out what you want to do with it. Now, you can self-publish. Now, the caveat here is that in the past, there's been a lot of vanity publishers that uh, basically took your money and gave you a mimeograph version of whatever you wrote, and they went happily along the way, and you're out a lot of money. Uh, also, if you self-publish from then on, a lot of the major publishing houses won't trust you. They figure, oh, he self-published, he's kind of slipped. Uh, we really don't want him on our imprinter. We, we, he's a self-publisher, he's not a serious author. Uh, there are a lot of folks out there. If you know Chris Hartsjes from the PHP world, he self-publishes a lot of his books, and he claims that's how he's paying for his BMW, but uh, there are ways to do that. So, many options this way. Um, you can uh, make your own PDFs from whatever you want. There are vanity publishers out there, as I meant. Amazon has Kindle Direct Publishing, where they, they will only take 30% of your royalties and let you sell the rest for whatever you think the market will bear. Uh, they have their own authoring software. So you can download that and use that. Uh, the only thing they want to know is your social security number and the routing number and bank account for your checking account. So very easy, low entry barrier there if you want to do that. And of course, there's other options out there. Um, there are other minor publishers that uh, will let you self-publish, um, but I'm trying to stick to the, the mainstream with the main publishers. Actual writing. Yeah, you still have to do that. After you've written the proposal, if you're still not sick of the idea, you actually start writing. So, uh, use an outline as a guide. I like to go from uh, first line of the first chapter to the last line of the rough chapter in kind of a rough format and slug it out and try to get down 80, 85 percent of the ideas and then I go back and tune and that is my, my first draft. Uh, I know other folks who actually do one complete perfect chapter before going on to the next chapter. That's not me, it might be you. Uh, set up a, a, a regular place and a regular time and a regular routine to do that. One of my college professors would get up every morning at five o'clock and write for an hour. Why is that? Well, he was kind of an early bird. He'd been in the Marine Corps and didn't really think that sleeping past five o'clock was healthy for you. And also he had little children that woke up promptly at 6.30. So set up a routine. Now some days you're gonna have better results than others. It's like coding. You know, some days you're hot and you're you're coding away and it goes great. Next thing you know, it's 10.30 at night and you've missed dinner, but you're happy because you've done it. Other days you stare at the screen and go, why did I stop being a music major? <laughs> um, writing's just like that. Also, do not self-edit too much on the first pass. Get the main ideas out there. Uh, rough it out. Lay down the, the, the basic tracks and come back and add the fills later. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, if you have source code, Keep a separate copy of it out there for your technical editor. I'll tell you what a technical editor is later. Text editing software. 99% of the folks out there will tell you they don't matter, they don't care what you use for text editing software, as long as it's Microsoft Word. I, I wish I had a better answer here. I wish that they used LibreOffice or anything else, but um, Word is the default format. And by the way, if you're doing this for a book and you're hoping to get some income, it is a tax write-off for you. So keep that receipt. Uh, first pass. Um, try to do a stream of consciousness. Do your James Joyce best. Put everything out there you think you can do and more. Just let it all fling out. Um, don't worry about typos if you're a bad typist like I am. Just get it all out of you. Make it a catharsis. Get everything you can on that page. Second pass, um, do obvious things. 
hey, I'm, I'm, I'm running about C programming, but why do I have all this Python code in here? Can't do that. Make sure you're, what you're writing kind of matches as close as you can to your outline. Uh, if you have doubts about the readability, read things out loud. There are rules in English that none of us can verbalize, but it's the proper way of placing adverbs and adjectives before a noun that you hear, but you may not see when you write it down without listening to yourself if you don't speak out loud while you type. And as you're doing your second pass, this is where you're going to go, yeah, but I forgot to mention this section. So you start hammering more and more stuff in there. Uh, keep going, keep adding to it, uh, keep trying to bulk it up. And after the first pass, maybe a second pass, double check, do your chapters follow the outline? Um, did you need to update the outline? By the way, that's an important thing to do. Uh, so if you suddenly discover there's a new version of your software and has five new features, put that in your outline and write down information on the five new features. Did you cover everything in the proposal? Uh, if you're writing a book for novice Java developers and you're into the Swing framework, no, you've overscoped. Uh, do your examples match, match the test text? Uh, by the way, it's, the more you have there in this level, the more redundancy you have and the more examples you have to the point of being painful, the better. Uh, does what you have on the page look right? Does it make sense? And then go out and do the grammar checks, do the spelling checks, and once again, read it out loud, and basically take a look at it. Does it look right? Does it do what you want it to do? Does it say roughly what you want to say? Now, at some time, you might actually want to go out and hire a professional editor. Uh, those of you in the PHP world might know Cara uh, Sedgwick Ferguson. She's now working for PHP Architect. Uh, she made her living, and still makes her living as a professional editor. They will greatly improve what you write, but they don't know your tech. So if you have something that you think is technically proficient, but it reads like the back of a cereal box under monosodium glutamate and all the other preservatives, hire an editor to smooth out what you're writing. Now, every editor is different. Uh, they might have different processes. They might want to see a chapter uh, up front. They may not. They might want to see the entire book. Uh, if they happen to know your subject matter even tangentially, or their husband's cousin actually touched a computer five years before. That helps, it's a little bit of a in with them. Um, they may do things like add indexes or reformat your stuff, but they won't check your source code. And make sure that you discuss with them up front what their rate is per, per board, per hour, per page, or per project, and get a contract. Um, and they may want to see a writing sample up front, or they might want to see the entire book up front. Now, the big publishing houses, when you get ready to go, they'll actually assign you two editors. One's going to be the person who does the chores I saw there, I mentioned earlier, where they go through and make sure that the thing is a cohesive compilation of your thoughts, that it's well formatted and uh, well spelled. But for a technical book, they should give you a technical editor. Usually you can refer a friend of yours. Hopefully it's someone who knows your tech. Uh, in my case, I got my counterpart from Europe to go through all my examples. Um, have them check your code. Uh, ask them to run it through whatever lit program you have available for your code. Um, once again, keep it in a separate copy for, for them to uh, cut and paste. And it's one of those things where they might come back and say, you know, this example here doesn't really kite, kite, uh, doesn't cut it the way I, I think you should do it. It would be better if you do it this way. They're trying to help you make a better product. Don't keep your ego in front of your goal. Make sure that they, uh, if they give, give good constructive stuff to use it, it's very valuable. And, and ironically, it's very cheap. Okay, once again, your, your editor, your folks at the publishing company, they don't know a Kubernetes from a Python from a JavaScript. They know books, they know English usually, and they know spelling. And often they're very anal about that. So double check 
Always double check your lang language and spelling. And one of the problems with technical subjects is you'll be good way through and a new feature will come out or a new version will come out and something might be deprecated or in more cases something's added to it and you'll have to adjust. Uh, some cases you're going to have to talk to your editor about it. Yeah. So be it. Type of noodle is it'll pass grammar check and spelling check and still be wrong. Yeah. Um, yes. Good. Good. I caught that just as it came up, but thank you for catching it too. Um, it's one of the things we're we're in a community where all everything under our feet is constantly shifting. So um, make sure that you're you're up on your tech. So you finally have everything finished. You think you've got the final version out to the editors uh, they're coming back and they're fairly happy with it they're making minor revisions and they're doing little grammar checks and coming back you with double check this paragraph does this read the way you want and sometimes it does and sometimes you want to change it and um, this is where the hard work gets this is you're on the finish line but it's all uphill into the snow past Mount Everest you have to uh, review everything chapter by chapter, go through all the illustrations, go through all the source code, and it is tedious, but you're almost there. So final editor will probably, uh, you'll probably be paired with someone who knows the company's processes. They know how to get things from what you put into them into pre-press, actually onto the printing press, and into the warehouse. Um, they probably work with a lot of authors. They probably have 30 they're working on at any one time, if not more and they're in a hurry and they may not have a lot of time to spend with you. So do not abuse their time and take any suggestions they have heartily. Also, they once again have no clue on your subject. So they don't know your tech. And by the way, double check their work. I didn't do that. Um, I was using the word idempotent to say that if you want a string of data to come out in the same format you put in, rather than using the MySQL JSON document type, which will organize it and sort it by the key value pair, um, use a string. So it goes in the same way it comes out, item potent. Guess what word? Bingo. And that was the big hit on the MySQL Twitter feed for a couple days. Yep. That was special. And that was kind of embarrassing. And since the publishing houses changed for the Oracle Press, um, there's no way that I'm going to do a second edition or be able to go back and revise that in future editions. So uh, whatever civilization digs up our civilization 20,000 years from now, they're going to read that book and go, did he really mean to say item potent instead of impotent? Uh, once again, um, technical letter. You may be assigned one. Hopefully, they'll ask you if you have a friend who can do it. I was lucky that Fred Deschamps, my counterpart from uh, Brussels, was able to do that. And I don't know how much they paid him, but it was probably a couple hundred bucks at most, and he put in a lot of work. And once again, um, if they're anal retentive, that really helps, and they will have suggestions that will help your book. So, final handoff. You have electronic forms you probably signed saying, yeah, this is, this is the book as promised. It's finally delivered. Boom. Uh, in your contract, you will have written out what your rights are. Um, in, uh, you've probably all heard the stories about the rock stars in the 50s or Solomon Lindo who wrote uh, The Lion Sleeps Tonight who basically got ripped off of millions, if not billions of dollars because the contracts were changed. They were moved around all that. And he wasn't really pu promised any publishing rights. Um, your contract will say, after you hand it off, how soon they have to have it out. Uh, they might have a down payment on royalties or a uh, draw on royalties they'll send you. And you'll have a rough idea, contractually, after you turn it off, how soon you'll be able to see your book. Um, by the way, a major publisher will go out and get an ISBN number. You can actually get these yourself, but it helps to have the publisher do that because they go out and get a whole block of them and they're used to doing it. Uh, the paperwork is not that onerous, but if you're a techie, it's something you're not used to doing. 
Logos, uh, once again, MySQL has a logo that's trademarked by Oracle, and I had to have that double-checked. Uh, it helped have me working for the Oracle Press. Double-check the graphics. If you have graphs and charts, you want to make sure you have the right graphs and charts at the right time in the right place. And then copyrights. Um, make sure your book is copyrighted. If it's not, um, someone makes one change to it, becomes a derivative work, and now they basically own your work. It's real nasty. So, I started writing this book while sitting in airports, uh, waiting for flights during flight cancellations because I didn't like the documentation we had. And a little bit of, after a year I, after I started, um, I got a box from McGraw Hill with 20 copies of my book. And I was very excited to see it pop up on Amazon. And you see little notices on Amazon, almost out of stock, order yours today, uh, being reordered, uh, back in stock, very exciting. And uh, now 20 years ago, you could go to the Barnes and Nobles and they had a big computer section, you could see your book. Very rarely do you now see te new technical books at Barnes and Nobles, so I know I'll never see that. Um, but it's also very fun to actually have your, your real copy in hand. And it's also real fun to be able to tell your friends, oh yeah, you can download my book at Amazon. Uh, by the way, I'll be giving away a copy of my book at 4 o'clock on a talk on um, the MySQL and JSON data type for those who are interested. And with that, what inputs do you all have? Yes, sir. Yeah, um, your, your editors will tell you what they want and they'll also have you sign a release for every photograph claim, where you claim that that is my original work, that's my photograph, I'm not cribbing it from somebody else. Uh, the folks I know who've done stuff with pictures say it's fairly straightforward. Some major publishing houses have worked for doing that. If you're self-publishing, I would document when you took the picture, where and how, with what equipment, and note that down someplace in your book notes so that if someone ever comes back to you and said, hey, that's actually my picture, um, right now, in Texas, there's a nasty lawsuit. There's a gentleman who took a picture of downtown Houston and put his watermark on there. University of Houston, Houston took his watermark off the picture and used it on their, their recruitment posters and their catalogs. And he sued, and right as of last week, he was told by the state judges that you have no rights to your own work, so it's going to the Supreme Court. I'm sure the Supreme Court's going to reverse that. So save yourself heartache and, and effort. Make sure it's an original photo. Make sure you document it when you took it and how you took it, and keep that in your notes just in case it ever boomerangs on you. So. Uh, I would add the copyright of those photos to the Library of Congress. Okay, great thing there. Most cameras, you can put a copyright notice in the EX of it. Uh, in other words, in the metadata in the photos. Right, but if it's yeah, you it's for it's soon, for legal purposes. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I've been told the worst thing you can have happen is have your photograph turn into a meme that becomes extremely popular, <laughs> that's scatological about someone that you really don't care about and you keep getting it sent to you. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Your book may have nothing to do with your work, but guess what? Your employment contract may say that every output from you is, belongs to your boss. Uh, years ago, I was working for a defense, defense contractor. I wrote in my contract that I have several projects on the side. I was working in bands, I was writing on a movie script, and I said, I want these excluded from the contract. And they almost didn't hire me. Um, if they hadn't been in dire need of some Linux help or Unix help, they wouldn't have hired me, but it's one of those things where they can actually claim, you're our employee, your contract with us says that we own all your output. Sir. I have a question in the, on the, on the comment that is basically asking for Microsoft Word like Swift and string and union dashes or, or dashes between words that have prefix and special that begin with a vowel. And I saw our, a large organization with a huge corporate sponsor and their big sign had uh, Yeah. 
then the question is, you're an expert on, on this. Um, yes. I'm not an expert on anything. But there's a lot of things that I've worked with over the years where, you know, finding the right answer is a question of going, you know, you go through the documentation, you go to the spec, you go through all this, you keep looking at things and revisions, and it takes you like days, right? sometimes weeks to find the correct answer. And if you're working on things like that, it seems like a shame that other people are going to have to do this and can't, you know. So yeah. Is there any sort of market, I mean, I'm not necessarily talking about for money, for like a book, even like a, you know, self-published book that would answer this question? And yeah. Answer. Yeah, I've seen stuff like that put in cookbooks. I've also seen... I've also seen websites where a guy says, you know, the, for my 25 years of playing with C, these are the things I found, and here's my refer point, points for them. Um, the other thing is, I have a friend who routinely has bookmarks that I would give my right arm for, and I say, okay, what have you discovered in the past six months? Because he finds all these wonderful, crazy little things out there that, um, um, uh, one was actually a piece of Postgres trivia that was very valuable for me because I was working on something that my skill was doing in that arena. And it's one of those things where I knew we had the bookmark, but he had to go through like 5,000 bookmarks to find that one. So it helps to have your own little web page, even if it's on your own server where you know that is, and then try to share that. So. Well, half the value of a show like this is the hallway track. Someone will say, hey, I don't know how I'm doing this, but it, how does anyone else do it? And someone else will have a brilliant idea, and someone will say, no, that's rubbish. What you want is you want this, and they'll hand you a thumb drive with their code on there, and it does work, and it's, it's going to sell. If you want to do stuff like that and you don't care about money, set up a media wiki instance and write how-tos, like going through the whole thing. And you've gone through like this horrible process, and you're like, there's information out there, but it's nuggets you know, a gleaming gold in the midst of piles of chicken shit. Um, and it took you weeks to put it all together, and you're like, there is no one good thing out there. Um, you can write that in a MediaWiki instance. Um, you can also, if you prefer, you can go to Stack Exchange and ask and answer your own question and just go through everything step by step, put screenshots. The tools are there at Stack Exchange to make a really, really good you know, beginning to end, this is how you do all the things. You'd be like, this is my question, and I'm answering my question, and I'm done with that. You can get karma at Stack Exchange for that, or like I said, you just go to the MediaWiki instance on your own. Does not care about money might be overstating it a little bit? Um, <laughs> I don't care about money. I just kind of feel like I would like if somebody wants to buy like a hard copy, that would be wonderful, but you know, I'd be happy to share it if there is some able to get that for it. You know? yeah. What you do get out of it, if you do, you know, throw up a media wiki instance on your own server, or you know, answer a ton of questions on Stack Exchange, whether it's answering answering ones that people ask, or whether it's answering your own asked question just to get the good thing out there. Either way, if you do it right, you tie your real name to it, and eventually that does start to bear fruit. You get people contacting you and wanting consulting. Um, you know, you can put up a Patreon link. I don't know how far you'll get with that, honestly. But this is what I did. Um, starting about 10 or 15 years ago, I uh, made FreeBSD Wiki and then Ubuntu Wiki, and neither one paid me a dime directly, but that's all been part of the process to get me to the point where when you Google Jim Salter right now, I'm like the top three results, despite there being an AP reporter whose crap gets published in the newspaper every single day, also named Jim Salter. And that eventually turns into, you know, you can actually take your career places. The, the other option is, I don't know how many of you know Adam Culp. He used to work for Rogue Wave uh, with the Zen framework, and he runs Sunshine PHP. He started doing little YouTube videos on running Composer with PHP and other little things. And he was looking for another job. It helped get him a job as a developer relations specialist. And it's one of those things where maybe two minutes on YouTube here, uh, wiki page here, um, like he said, go out to Stack Exchange, not Stack, o Stack Overflow, please. Stack Overflow is a, <laughs> uh, a nut house. Um, and having several crazy relatives, I can tell you I do know my nut houses. Um, 
But it's one of those things, if you want to share it, put it on a web page, you run across someone's answer and say, oh, this is over on here. And the great thing is you'll find someone who will argue with you and actually have something better you can put out there, which helps. Yes, sir? So I presume you use Word? Very reluctantly, yes. Um, I've seen some, I've seen some script type apps for a different platform to, that you can lay it out and then you can so if you're working in chapter one to try to drop to six you just yeah I've seen several of those I've tried a couple of them I didn't like them uh, McGraw Hill had their own little uh, plugins they wanted to use uh, that weren't too obtrusive um, I have a friend who wrote two textbooks in tech that were English literature textbooks so it, whatever you want to use you can use. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll go to the chapter where I, I know I left off and say, okay, what's the next bullet point I want to cover? Oh, that reminds me, I need to go back here and I need to do this. I have a very ADHD um, right. scattershot method and it works for me. But there. If you use Microsoft Word and you're not familiar with style, get familiar with style. Have a style for a paragraph, have yeah. style for a chapter, have a style for a page. It will save you and your editor tons of work. Well, that's a good point. That, that's something that the publisher might, might provide you as a unique thing. Yeah. Their style. Yeah, they'll have their own invention rules. The problem with style for Microsoft Word, as I would see it, is the fact that you can't set up a custom style and save it out as a template. So you have to go in there and use the default style, which is ugly because you have this ugly blue or you can enter. Uh, something else. The writer has a much better implementation of styles than Microsoft Office. Yeah, and, and something I'm going to go off the microphone on this so it won't get on the recording. Not 100%. And it's hard to depend on the version of Word because versions of Microsoft Word are incompatible with themselves. I'm going to give a slightly dissenting opinion on that as somebody who writes a lot. Um, the, the problem usually is that people make really sloppy, badly, inconsistently formatted documents. That's the usual human tendency. A bold here, an italic there, an angle font change there. And all this crap eventually just collapses because it barely worked in the first program in the first place. Um, what you really need to do is you need to get the habit of not doing any of that. You say, all right, my tools are. I have heading one, heading two, heading three. You know, I use that consistently for chapter head titles, you know, for uh, subhead titles, whatever. Those are basically the only three things I use, and maybe I'll bold or italicize something manually, you know, occasionally in a sentence. If that's all the formatting you do, you can swap that from format to format to format. You can do HTML, you can do WordPress markup, you can do LibreOffice, you can do Microsoft Word, and it will all come up fine. Let your actual editor worry about what a head one or a head two should exactly look like. If you don't go nuts trying to fiddle every little tiny bit about how it looks on the page, you'll do yourself a huge favor. Uh, for those in the history, look up SGML, which is the predecessor of HTML, because they had all these government contractors writing documentation, they're all writing different chapters. The idea is if you keep to a heading one, when we put everything back together, we'll figure out what a heading one is. So, uh, yes, sir. A friend of mine, uh, she's a math professor, he's, his definition of hangover is kind of amazing. Having worked for 
in a computer department run by mathematicians, I can concur to that, yeah. It's not as glamorous as you make it sound. Yeah. But he did it exactly like he wanted. Oh, yeah. And I don't know, uh, do publishers accept latex? Um, maybe a couple academic presses. Uh, Donald Knuth would probably appreciate it, but the trouble is 99.999% of them, no word. They love word. And they're going to want you to use word. So as much as I love other program uh, word processing software, it's kind of... You're stuck that way. Yes, sir. Well, that's 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 where you're gonna that's where you're gonna work with your editor and your tech and the, your uh, your copy editor. Um, do you work with the UX design folks at all? I, I, I used to do, I mainly did full stack stuff, and then I started doing the lower half of the stack. If you work with really good UX folks, they'll tell you, code your page this way, and I'll make it look pretty. I'll do all the CSS. I'll do that. Just put it in this div and name it this, and have this field all there. Don't worry what it looks like, and it looks. Yeah. And the stuff that you used to debug looks absolutely nothing like the finished product, and usually, hopefully, it looks better. Uh, a few times it doesn't, but yeah. And then my, my secondary question is, do you have any experience working with notebooks? Um, I've talked to their vendors to buy books, but I didn't go approach them about uh, submitting a book. Uh, I was kind of lucky that I was working, and still am working for Oracle. The Oracle press folks were very receptive to me. I talked to them at Oracle Open World and said, I have this book, it's half written, would you be interested in seeing it? I got a contact name, sent it to her, and surprisingly, 10 days later, she said, yeah, send us on more. We really want to publish this, so. Yes, sir. Uh, the, to be honest with you, I've talked to A Press. I talked to um, to someone who does the uh, Kindle publishing stuff, but I haven't talked to Manning. I haven't talked to. Um, oh, I'm trying to remember the other one. Um, yeah, there's a whole bunch of them out there. That uh, let me get the screen back up. Um, the good news is there's a whole bunch of folks out there looking for content, and. If you can start off at the biggest house possible, it's probably better for your, your reputation. But, yes, sir? Uh, I used to be a stand-up comic, and I used to have write between 20 and 150 jokes a day. I was writing mainly for other comedians, and it's one of those things where if you're, on, if you're on that pace, you just do it. Good, bad, or indifferent, you just crank them out. Um, if you're a Stephen King and you have burnout, uh, you have to console yourself in your mansion or your, your speedboat or whatever you have. Uh, something like this, the folks I talk to who write technical books, if you get burnout, walk away from it for a day or two and then remind yourself you're a professional programmer, you've written worse code, sit down and start writing and eventually something will Get on the page, and away you go. Sir? I kind of want to tackle that a little bit. Um, most of the time when you get burned out, it's because you're not cutting the task down into manageable bite-sized segments, and you're looking at the whole thing, and you're like, fuck, I just don't know where to start. I don't want to do this. I want to go do anything else. Just put something on the page. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be the thing you're going to send to the publisher. You have like, if you're staring at a completely blank page, start working on an outline. If you got an outline and you're starting to work on one section, you're like, ah, it's too big, whatever. Put something down. Cut it in half. 
you know, a couple of notes. Okay, well, I guess I can write this paragraph right now. That doesn't seem too bad. Next thing you know, you're right back into it. Where you're really getting screws and you're just sitting there staring at the screen going, eh. It doesn't have to be perfect. Just put something on the page, make it better later. A uh, professional writer I know before tackling a major project, um, they tend to write a lot of histories that are a lot of detail, a lot of research. Uh, they'll do five years of research before writing the first paragraph of the book. One of their writing exercises, they'll take something like a children's fairy tale and spend a half a day crafting it from the other side. Uh, Goldilocks is a spy. Um, Little Red Riding Hood as a potential um, self-suicide victim wanting to kill herself but not having the guts to and trying to attract the wolf. Hansel and Gretel as, you know, not really the children being taken of the old lady. They want to take over the old lady's step. Something just twisted and weird, totally different from what they do, and they'll spend a half hour or half a day writing this just to get all the little weird flakiness out of there, and they go back to the project and say, okay, this is what I want to do. I've got all the weird stuff out. I've had this little writing exercise. Away I go. Well, when most of us were growing up, there were things, oh, get your book published, spend $5,000, get 50 copies of this book from the such and such vanity press. And it's something where you do that, you hand it out to your grandparents and everyone would be happy, but everyone knew that was kind of a, a pay-to-play book. Um, today, with the online stuff, there's a lot more options like the, what the Kindle, the Kindle publishing is. Um, I've known folks who've done art books. Uh, a buddy of mine published a scuba diving photography art book. Uh, each edition, each copy was 500 bucks and it cost him close to half a million dollars to have all the books printed. And it was basically an um, exercise in love for him. And for him, it was worth selling his house to get his photographs off to people he knew would really appreciate it. I don't know if you, you're probably not in that position, but it's one of those things where if you have these photographs, um, there's a book called The Photographer's Market. Go to that and see. They have guides on which photo editors are looking for photos, which ones are writing books, and how to assemble your own photo book. So. Okay. I, I've done a fair amount of research, and like, you know, I, we're actually writing part of my next hardcover, so it's like prohibitively like, expensive. Yeah. But you, you know, there are so many print shops that are doing like your trade paperbacks. Yeah. Like the chance to bring like money. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to get a publisher. Well, this guy actually had the rice paper picked out and actually bought the rice paper before he went to the publishing house and said, this is what I want. This is the type of leather binding I want. By the way, I have the cows already picked out. And yeah, but he had more money than sense. So. Yeah, th there's a lot of color publishing done for the high-end graphic stuff. I know an Akito sensei who was working with a Japanese publisher, and when his demands got too much, they sent him right to China, and he made several trips to Shanghai to look at these amazing offset presses they have there to print off his book. But it's very expensive, and like I said, he had a couple trips to China to go over to proof stuff. So. Realistic expectations, and like you, you know, these 
with the baby pod. Um, you still have COVID two ways. You, you know, um, you can get books greater for like under five bucks a piece. Like you, you know, like you have forty pages, sixty pages color. Like you have trade paperbacks. So you yeah. Can, you know, it would be nice to have you know books with friends that when coffee table books stuff like that. Yeah. Well, this guy's a professional photographer, and he's trying to be, have his own show-off book, kind of his own, his own I Love Me wall. And um, it's, it's one of those things for him, the cost was exactly one, because he knew what exactly what the color saturations he wanted. He knew the Pantone colors he wanted for the highlights. He had everything sussed out. So basically, he had it all assembled in his mind, had all the instructions laid out before he actually went to the people who actually just did the, the printing. So. Yeah, that's all nice, but like, you know, I'm not. Yeah, get the photographer's market. Um, 2019 or 2020 and see what they say. I'm going to text Thank you so much. Yeah. Sir, where were they? Uh, so I teach college writing uh, at Georgia State University. A lot of things we've been talking about uh, and a lot were actually are, you can find a lot of these uh, tips and tricks in uh, more detail. I had a book called uh, Writing Without Teachers by a guy named Peter Elbow. If you guys want to search it on Amazon, there's Um, I just want to return to something Dave said earlier about, you know, check with your employer, uh, you know, before you write something because, you know, you may have, your contract may state that your employer owns everything. A, he's not kidding. B, it doesn't have to be like that. When you get a job, when they offer you an employment contract, read it. They will frequently try to own you lock, stock, and barrel. You don't have to agree to that. Bring a red pen. Whack out the sections you don't like. They'll usually just say okay and move on. I don't think I've ever taken an employment contract that I didn't redline through two or three objectionable clauses. I've never not gotten a gig because of that. It's redline it and initial it. Yeah. I, uh, I did the same thing uh, with one of my employers. I've had a couple of projects I was working on, and I said, well, except for these things, okay? You know, um, and they didn't object at all. I didn't care. Yeah. And yes, sir. Yeah, we get Make sure your boss knows, make sure you have an company, exactly. company letterhead. Um, Tom Schultz, who had the band Boston that was very popular when I was much, much, much younger. Um, supposedly, his employers at Polaroid said, you're getting a lot of money from these records, we'd like some. Mm -hmm. And uh, supposedly his, uh, his contract with them, is, is, he had that laid out. But if he hadn't, if he hadn't had something on a piece of letterhead, I'm, I can sure that, you know, it would have been Tom Schultz and the One Step Camera Band. So that, 